Good morning, everyone, and um, welcome again to our Friday morning uh, program. Um, this is uh, a slight departure from our usual journal club format, and again, uh, next week is going to be another slight departure from our uh, usual journal club format um, when we run our first um, uh, uh, regularly scheduled um, virtual tumor boards. And just to give a quick um, introduction to that that, that particular program, uh, Mike Tuttle will be um, our sort of master of ceremonies uh, next week. And uh, we hope and expect to get through um, three cases of varying types to um, uh, to highlight a variety of different points um, that uh, we hope will be extremely educational. But um, this morning, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Maria Cabanillas, who is oncologic endocrinologist and the faculty director of clinical research in the Department of Endocrine Neoplasia at MD Anderson. Um, Dr. Cabanillas' research is um, really focused on advanced as well as aggressive thyroid cancer, um, emphasizing molecular targeted therapies and immunotherapy, which I'm sure will be um, covered this morning. Um, she and her colleagues at MD Anderson have developed a program called FAST, which is an acronym for Facilitating Anaplastic Thyroid Cancer Specialized Treatment. Um, and the focus of this multidisciplinary program is to streamline the evaluation and initiation of therapy for patients with this devastating condition. We were just actually talking about um, how difficult uh, the year of um, the pandemic has been for patients to get access to FAST. Um, and uh, so I'm sure that uh, Maria will talk just a little bit about the functionality of that program and what it means for uh, patients and um, rapid uh, rapid deployment of whatever therapies might be available to them. Um, Dr. Cabanillas is the principal investigator on several clinical trials involving the treatment of advanced thyroid cancer. Um, she's involved both nationally and internationally and recently served on the ATA and a plastic thyroid cancer guidelines committee, uh, which completed its work and the fruits of their labor uh, were published in um, the up updated set of guidelines last month. And so, um, as always, I encourage all of our attendees to send in questions that I will do my best to get to all of them as best I can at the end. Um, and with no further ado, I'm gonna turn over the platform to Maria. Uh, so thank you once again for joining us. Thank you, thanks for that introduction. Um, I, I have a lot of slides this morning, but a lot of them thankfully are pictures. And so um, uh, we'll try and get through this in 45 minutes. It's actually quite surprising um, that, the, that I was able to actually make a talk this long on neoadjuvant therapy. You know, like several years ago, it would have been a very short lecture. So we'll do our best to, to get through this. Um, let's see. Okay, there are my disclosures. The objectives are to discuss targeted therapy in thyroid cancer and neoadjuvant therapy. So uh, just as an overview, we have two major um, types of cells in the thyroid gland. We've got the epithelial follicular cells and the C cells. C cells, of course, um, from which medullary thyroid cancer um, uh, derived from. And these have particular uh, mutations, commonly RET and RAS mutations. Um, the epithelial-derived thyroid cancers consist of papillary follicular and herthal cell, which are considered differentiated thyroid cancers. They also have a particular set of, of mutations. So in papillary thyroid cancer, we see a lot of, um, we see the majority of the fusions occurring in that disease. Um, and then we have a lot of BRAF mutations uh, and some RAS mutations, folliculars, mostly RAS. Uh, sometimes P10, sometimes PPAR gamma fusions. And then Herthel cell doesn't tend to have a lot of mutations. Um, as these become less differentiated and more aggressive, it's, they're, they're accumulating new mutations, but they, they still have that driver from which they were derived. So if they were papillary originally um, with a BRAF mutation, you'll still see that as they become less differentiated and finally undifferentiated thyroid cancer. So there are really three classes of, of modern systemic therapy for thyroid cancer. So we're not talking about the cytotoxics. 
Um, the, the three major categories are the VEGF receptor inhibitors, multi-kinase inhibitors, um, which are antiangiogenic drugs, the oncoprotein driver drugs, so that they're targeting genetic mutations or fusions, and then um, targeting the immune microenvironment with checkpoint inhibitors, uh, which is kind of in you know its early uh, phases. And, um, and I'm not going to talk too much about this. Um, because uh, we don't have good, we don't really use it in the neoadjuvant setting except for in combination with targeted therapy. Um, so as you all know, the, the, the VEGF receptor inhibitors are listed here, linvatinib, serafinib, vandetinib, cabo, and then we have the BRAF inhibitors as our, as our major class of oncoprotein-driven uh, drugs, uh, our RET inhibitors, and our NTREC inhibitors. So uh, this is just a list of the targetable mutations in thyroid cancers that I that I just went over. So RET, BRAF, I put KRAS G12C to fill up the slide. This is very early stage of um, development, um, mostly in lung and colorectal cancer, but you may hear more about this um, uh, as this progresses further in um, development. Uh, but the RET inhibitors, you know, selpercatinib, pralcetinib, um, the BRAF inhibitors, vemurafenib, dubrafenib, and encorafenib, which is one of the uh, newer BRAF inhibitors uh, that you may have heard of. Dubrafenib really is the most common one used in thyroid cancer. Gene fusions are, are actionable too. Um, I, I wish they were more common. Uh, so we have uh, RET fusions and NTREC fusions, ALK fusions, ROS1, and PPAR gamma fusions. And then listed here are all of the drugs that target those. So larotrectinib and trectinib are NTREC inhibitors. There are a number of ALK inhibitors um, that none of them are approved for thyroid cancer and ROS1 inhibitors. Um, and then, you know, the PPAR gamma fusions are very rare, but there is um, a report of rosiglitazone uh, being efficacious in one patient with poorly differentiated thyroid cancer with this fusion. So what about response rates? So that's really what we want to know because um, that's what's going to drive whether we want to use these drugs as neoadjuvant. And so if you look at the BRAF inhibitors um, in papillary thyroid cancer, um, the response rates are, are, are relatively low, 30 to 39%. Um, the BRAF MEK inhibitor combinations, which are approved for anaplastic thyroid cancer, are higher, um, much higher, 63%. Um, and then the, um, the combination in papillary thyroid cancer is much lower. For the RET inhibitors, these also have very high response rates in medullary for RET mutated, 56 to 71%. For papillary um, RET fusion, it's 79%. Um, so actually, this is not papillary. I should say it's it's RET fusion thyroid cancer. Um, that's incorrect on the slide there. Uh, for NTREC inhibitors in in papillary thyroid cancer, 90% response rate, phenomenal. In ATC, much lower. So it's kind of the opposite of the BRAF inhibitors in ATC, where there are lots of very high response rates, um, much lower in papillary, and then the the inverse with the NTREC inhibitors. Um, VEGF receptor inhibitors uh, also have very good response rates, particularly um, the, uh, in differentiated thyroid cancer with linvatinib, 65% uh, response rate, uh, in medullary, 28 to 45%. Okay, so what is neoadjuvant? Well, probably everybody on this, um, uh, on this webinar knows that it's the administration of a therapeutic agent before um, the surgical resection, and the idea is to, of course, shrink the tumor. So the problem, though, with targeted therapy as neoadjuvant um, is that these patients all, um, these tumors all become resistant eventually. And so the idea is to try and catch them before that happens so that, you know, if they've had a response, you can operate on them. Um, and as this is just showing you one of our patients that we published. This was actually a series of patients that had been treated with BRAF inhibitors. They were both anaplastic and papillary thyroid cancer patients. And this is just showing you one of our ATC patients um, who had a very nice response here, you see, to, to the BRAF MEK inhibitor combination on this scalp metastasis. It essentially goes away. Um, and then 
it starts to grow back. And at this point, um, this tumor was removed as was her uh, primary um, uh, thyroid cancer. And uh, we found that the patient had a RAS mutation. So this is a series of patients that, that acquired RAS mutations. And these were not present in the original tumor, the four treatment. So um, again, you know, why do we, why do we operate? I, I get this question a lot, and so I kind of harp on it because people ask me, well, you know, if they're responding to kinase inhibitors and they're doing okay, why, are you, why do you subject them then to a surgery? And really it's because eventually they'll all develop resistance and then you have to go to another, you know, another kinase inhibitor um, and they're not curative, right? But, but surgery can be curative. So let's start with ATC. This is a patient of ours who was transferred into our hospital with a tracheostomy. You see this large anaplastic tumor coming through her skin. It was very painful. And um, she had a BRAF mutation, so we put her on uh, dibrafenotrebentinib, and this is four weeks after. But these actually respond much sooner than four weeks. Um, this is just the time point where she, after she was dismissed from the hospital, that she came back. Um, but these patients start to uh, swallow much better after just a few days of being on these inhibitors. So you can actually, in some patients, avoid a tracheostomy if you can identify them as having a BRAF mutation before um, they get into real trouble. Um, and because these are such rapid and dramatic responses, uh, we are able to take these out. So this is just the cross-section um, of, of this, of one of our ATC patients. Um, and you see after dibrafen a, a really a really great response. So um, this was our index patient. And so I wanna start with him and then I'll show you our series of patients with anaplastic thyroid cancer. This was a 60 year old guy who showed up um, with, uh, you know, having a lot of problems breathing, um, he could not swallow. He was dehydrated when he showed up to MD Anderson. Um, he had Strider. We told him, you're going to need a tracheostomy. And he said, you know, I don't want that. And so um, we crossed our fingers and, and hoped for a BRAF mutation. Um, and he actually did have it. Uh, we identified this by immunohistochemistry. So we did that very quickly. Um, and, and, um, and we were able to start him on therapy. And so you see his original tumor here. This is an unresectable situation for sure. I don't think anybody would argue that. Um, and this is what his PET scan looked like. So when I saw this PET scan, I didn't actually sleep that night thinking, you know, why did we bring this man down here? Um, he was from pretty far away and, you know, he's probably going to end up not being able to get back home. Um, but we put him on to and and, um, and he did very well. His tumor was um, much better after just a few days, but four weeks later, he um, he contacts me to say, I have this node that's growing, I have something growing in my neck on the left side again. And so we told him to come down immediately to Houston. We had already been um, trying to uh, obtain pembrolizumab on patients who um, were on dibrafenotrimitina because we had noticed, uh, at least on the clinical trial that we had been doing, that these patients were progressing um, oftentimes within a year. Usually about the nine month to 12 month mark, they've started to have progression. And so we kind of knew that this was gonna happen with this gentleman. So I'd already started ordering the pembrolizumab, we already had it. So on the fifth week of his treatment, we brought him down and put him on and added the pembrolizumab, the checkpoint inhibitor, um, to his regimen. And, um, and so uh, I just want to show you the um, survival curves for patients on um, BRAF inhibitors versus no BRAF inhibitors. These are all BRAF mutated patients. So um, in blue are the patients who have BRAF mutations and were on a BRAF inhibitor. In red are the patients that have BRAF mutations but were not treated with a BRAF inhibitor. And this is retrospective, of course. This was just before we had um, knowledge that these um, patients responded to BRAF inhibition. And so everything looks great that first year, right? So this is the one year mark here. Um, but when you look at that graph further out, you see, you start to notice that the um, that these patients that were responding are no longer responding and they're dying. And so um, we, um, 
uh, we decided that that before that happened, we probably needed to do something about that. And um, that something was basically using the checkpoint inhibitors to try and keep them from progressing and also um, operating. So this is what this gentleman's uh, uh, scan looked like after 13 weeks of debrafentramentin and pembrolizumab, which we lovingly call DTP. Um, and you see that this is now a, a tumor that can be resected. Um, so we, you know, we said, well, this was our first patient. We thought, well, you know, is this crazy <laughs> to do this? Um, but we decided to move forward because we knew this gentleman was eventually going to break through the, 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 the DTP also, and it was going to be a difficult situation. Um, this is just showing the PET scan after 13 weeks. Um, and then um, his baseline compared to um, the same kind of, you know, level section on his 13-week uh, scans. Um, so this um, is not uncommon. This is, you know, we see this in, in many patients, not just this patient. Um, so anyway, we did a total, well, we didn't, um, Mark Zafirio did a total thyroidectomy, bilateral central compartment, bilateral neck dissection. Um, the margins were close. It was an R1 resection. Um, he did have a post-operative wound infection on uh, post-op day nine, which is an uncommon thing to, for us to see in these patients. So I don't know if it was related to the treatment. Possibly it is. Um, the pathology showed a multifocal bilateral residual ATC, um, uh, six centimeters with significant extrathyroid extension, 28 of 96 metastatic nodes. Um, 15 were ATC, 13 PTC. And when you look at the pathology, um, so this is just looking at the pretreatment pathology and then the, um, the, the surgical resection after DTP. And you see these fibrotic areas in the, in the tumor. Um, so that's not an uncommon thing to see. And actually, I, I mean, I'm not a surgeon, um, I'm, as many of, many of you know, but um, what I'm told is that these are very kind of, you know, fibrotic, kind of matted down. And so it's not an easy surgery to perform. Um, the um, oftentimes, and this patient wasn't a great example of that, but oftentimes we just see residual papillary thyroid cancer. So we uh, published our first six patients of neoadjuvant, uh, dibrafenib, trametinib. Some of these patients were also treated with pembrolizumab. Some were not because, it, you know, some of them were early on. Um, and uh, and this is just to show you, and, and you know you can read about this in thyroid, but this is just to show you the um, the ATC viability on the resected specimen. Um, so you know we had ranges from zero to fifty percent. So fifty percent was the gentleman that I just showed you, but the majority of these patients had very little residual ATC, five less than five zero zero zero. Um, and so what's, what is left in the specimen is papillary thyroid cancer. And that kind of reflects the, this you know, difference in responses that we see between the papillary and the ATC patients to BRAF inhibitors, where you know, we see some responses in papillary, but um, around 30% response rate, but really dramatic responses in ATC. So the papillary thyroid cancer component just doesn't respond as well, and it certainly doesn't go away completely. We did give this gentleman um, uh, post-operative radiation. Uh, we held the debrafenib and trametinib during radiation um, because our radiation oncologists will not allow kinase inhibitors during um, uh, radiation. Um, but we did continue the Pembro. And um, you know, I just saw him, I think, last month, and he's still free of disease. Uh, we dropped the pembrolizumab after two years. OK, so what about longer outcomes? Um, We've uh, we've looked at our series of uh, patients treated at, at MD Anderson since 2000 until t about October 2019, um, and and we were kind of looking to see well did this fast program that Mark uh, mentioned prior did that really help patients you know it was a question that we had struggled to answer um, because we'd received a lot of criticism about bringing patients and giving them hope when they had ATC and all, you know, all of that business. Um, so 
we wanted to look at at our patients to see if they had benefited since fast and and so you know you can read about this in JAMA Oncology and and I'll send along some of these papers I, I didn't do it before the talk and I apologize for that um, but uh, but we then kind of specifically looked at our neoadjuvant patients because um, you know we wanted to know whether surgery had really helped them and now this is all retrospective so it's highly biased right because um, obviously we operated on the on the patients that were operable and um, but but this is the best that we could do um, right now so at the mo at that time we had 20 patients that had a BRF b600e mutation um, and underwent surgery and then we had 35 patients um, who did who also had a BRF b600e mutation but did not have surgery and you can see the you know the the, you can see this clear advantage in patients who had surgery, um, of course, again, highly biased. And so we are opening a clinical trial very, very soon. Um, it's been delayed because of COVID with DTP in the neoadjuvant setting. Um, so just a summary for the ATC portion of, of the neoadjuvant strategies is that we do think that it has improved overall survival we believe it's improved local regional control. And that's because only one of our patients in that in, in the series that I just showed you had recurrent neck disease. Um, another one developed mediastinal disease. Uh, and so pretty good lo local regional control. And you know, this is one of our goals is to um, also, you know, not not let these patients basically asphyxiate on their tumors. Um, and so I, you know, I think um, I think that's a a pretty a pretty good outcome for these patients, um, and then it improved their functional status, meaning that you know we only had uh, a few patients that had to have a temporary peg. Eventually, all of them came out. Three patients um, with a tracheostomy. Um, actually, two of these came out, and so one was temporary. And um, and so the ATA guidelines. We finally finished them after many many years. Um, and we were able to get this uh, into at least the 4B algorithm, the neoadjuvant. We actually also do this in 4C at MD Anderson. And of course, we add the uh, checkpoint inhibitor here. So a little bit different from what's published in the ATA guidelines, but we just didn't have the, um, the uh, publications to support um, the, you know, what we, we currently do at MD Anderson, but that, you know, that is our standard. So what about radiation for these patients? Um, in general, we say stage 4C, no XRT. So, you know, we don't want to lose control of the disease that's out here in, in usually in the lungs and bones. And so um, with our 4C patients, you know, we operate on them and then we just continue the BRAF MEK inhibitor plus or minus the checkpoint inhibitor. Um, so we don't stop to operate because remember what I said is that we have to stop the debraf and intramandibular during radiation. So we only give post-operative XRT in general to our, um, our patients with stage 4B disease. We do make some exceptions to that. Um, and so essentially the, the take home message here is, you know, that, that we're not sure about post-operative radiation. There are some pros about long-term control, of course. Um, the, um, the cons are, are the toxicity from radiation and then having to stop the BREF MEK inhibitor. And then um, we are studying, actually Ohio State has a study where they're, where they're looking at concurrent BREF MEK inhibitor with radiation, which I think is gonna be, um, would really benefit our patients if we could continue those drugs during radiation. Um, but we'll see if, if, if that is um, a tolerable combination. Okay, so, um, so neoadjuvant therapy for BRF mutated papillary thyroid cancer is something that we consider in, in some patients, select patients. Um, it's based on a study that we did here. Um, actually started this, this study, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say, when I was a fellow. <laughs> so, and we have not published it yet um, because of uh, certain problems with um, um, just having the staff to do the um, the molecular part of this of this trial. Hopefully, we will publish this um, within the next year. Um, but I did uh, I did talk about this. Uh, it seems like ages ago um, at ETA, we uh, we essentially 
uh, took patients that had locally advanced papillary thyroid cancer with a BRAF mutation. We gave them vemurafenib, a BRAF inhibitor, um, for about 56 days, and then we stopped the BRAF inhibitor and took them to surgery if they were operable. If they were inoperable, we had already separated those patients out before um, the decision of, of operating. So we had a, a group that was that we knew was going to not have surgery, um, and you know we would do core biopsies on those. And so we were really the the aim of this study was to look at the at the um, at the BRAF inhibition at the tumor level, um, which is what has delayed us here. So anyway, we enrolled 17 where we intended to operate. 14 were restaged at day 56. Three did not complete the 56 days of the kinase inhibitor. Um, and these were the responses after 56 days. So you see only three patients had a partial response, but we did have you know, at least 20% shrinkage in another five patients. And so 64% um, uh, actually had some regression, whether that's enough to be able to operate or not, you know, is, is debatable. These are the surgeries that we did, um, nodal dissection only in six patients, total thyroidectomy plus, you know, some form of nodal dissection in five patients. So 11 went to surgery. And uh, this is the pathologic response um, in the surgical tissue. And you see uh, these are the R0, R1s in green, um, R2 resections in orange, and then um, uh, the three patients that didn't go to surgery are also listed here. Um, and the three patients that didn't go to surgery was for progression um, in two of them, or, or they refused uh, in one patient. In terms of compl complications, we did have a, a donor site hematoma in the pectoralis muscle. One patient died um, after two weeks postoperatively from a fatal hemorrhage, and um, he did have carotid involvement. And so we believe that the tracheostomy tube actually may have uh, ruptured that carotid. Um, two patients um, died um, total on the study. One, the fatal hemorrhage that I just des described, and one from primary resistance to vemurafenib um, who died of progression. So, you know, mixed results in, in PTC. Um, there are modest responses in this disease to BRAF inhibitors, and, um, and you know, there are probably other good targets um, that, that we can consider for neoadjuvant. Um, and there's still some questions about whether, you know, post-operative radiation in these patients. Um, but what about radioiodine? So I want to talk a little bit about that, and I know this is a little bit off topic, but when we're thinking about putting patients on these inhibitors, um, these also are inhibitors that can re-differentiate tumors, right? So we can use them to help to concentrate uh, radioiodine. And so um, there are two studies that um, many of you are already aware of, the Selumetinib study that was published in New England in 2013, and there was subsequent trial from that, and then the Dibrafenib study with a small number, of, they both were small number of patients. Um, that was published in 2015. Um, and, you, and we did see that some patients had um, some nice responses to radioactive iodine shown there on those waterfall plots. So we um, actually do this at MD Anderson um, as in some of our patients as our standard of care. This is just showing you one of our um, one of our fellows who published our series. Um, these are the pre and post whole body scans. And so you see that these patients were all on either BRAF or MEK inhibitor, um, but they are able to take up uh, radioiodine much better after being on these inhibitors. And so that's something that can be incorporated into that neoadjuvant strategy. If you already have them on a BRAF inhibitor, you're going to take them to surgery. You know, you could see if they if if they also have better uptake than just keeping them on the on the inhibitor um, for the radioiodine. Okay, so moving along to medullary thyroid cancer, um, not much to say here because we don't have a lot of information, but we have, um, and I believe this is published, and I think I forgot to put the, uh, I, I forgot to put the reference here, but um, we had this 20-year-old man with just a horrific uh, ret mutated medullary thyroid cancer. Uh, we put him on uh, what's now called selpercatinib. It was Loxo-292 at that time. Um, we put him on a single patient protocol. 
um, because we wanted to use the drug as a neoadjuvant. So <clears throat> um, this was before the drug was approved. So we put him um, on cell percatinib and you see his um, tumor shrinks nicely. Um, he was taken to surgery and the tumor was resected. He has distant disease, so he continued on cell percatinib. Um, but because of this um, case, and, and because of the great responses that we see in both RET mutated medullary and RET fusion papillary thyroid cancer, um, this prospective clinical trial with new adjuvant cell percatinib um, is actually open now. We've opened it at our site, um, and we're trying to get it open at uh, several other sites. You, see, you can see the clinical trial number right there. Um, so that's all I have to say about medullary thyroid cancer. Um, Hopefully, we can enroll that trial and have some good data there. Um, okay, so what about neoadjuvant therapy with VEGF receptor inhibitors? Because you've heard me talk about cell percatinib, you've heard me talk about the BRAF MEK inhibitors, um, but you know, what if you don't have a RET fusion, RET mutation, or BRAF mutation, which is going to be the majority of our patients, right? And so, um, you know, I I think that VEGF receptor inhibitors they have you know, great responses in thyroid cancer. Um, and we have some drugs that have shorter half-lives, basically the linvatinib and serafinib. Pandetinib and cabozantinib have very long half-lives, and so it's going to be difficult to use these patients to use these drugs in the neoadjuvant setting because it just takes a long time to wash out um, before surgery. And I can talk a little bit about that washout period, but but basically. Linvatinib's uh, half-life is 28 hours, so that's pretty much the shortest that you're going to find with really, really good efficacy. Remember, I told you it was 65% response rate in differentiated thyroid cancer, so it seems like a really good candidate for uh, for neoadjuvant. But there are some issues that I want to point out, um, and so one of them is uh, just the safety of these drugs in general, um, and and the implications of that for a surgical candidate. So this is um, a, a publication by the Japanese who use a lot of linvatinib because linvatinib is approved in Japan uh, for anaplastic thyroid cancer. And so they have put out um, some information on uh, some of these kind of you know, horrible uh, carotid artery ruptures in patients with uh, anaplastic thyroid cancer, which is something that we see in anaplastic thyroid cancer. But of course, because of the, um, the antiangiogenic nature of these drugs, we, we're, we're gonna see it more in patients who are treated with linvatinib. Um, another issue is, um, and, and you know, and I want to point out that 45% of our ATC patients have great vessel involvement. That's not the, the necessarily the case in papillary. Um, fistulas also occur in advanced thyroid cancers. And so this is one of our patients. Um, this is a series of patients that developed aerodigestive fistulas. And so this is just a patient that had been on uh, one of the antiangiogenic drugs. I don't remember this particular patient, which one it was on, but you see that, the, um, that this patient then develops a fistula between the tumor and the trachea. Um, and those are very difficult to, uh, to remedy. And then I also found this paper in Oncology Pharmacy Practice, not a journal that I commonly read, um, but I found this pretty interesting because they looked at wound healing complications in patients uh, treated on linvatinib. And so there are only nine patients in this series. Um, of course, this is just what's been reported, but there were two of them that actually had been on it preoperatively, the linvatinib preoperatively. And um, one patient discontinued on post uh, preoperative day one, another preoperative day three. Okay, remember the half life of this drug is 28 days, and it does cause poor wound healing. So it's not surprising that these patients um, develop problems. And so it, it's something we just need to be careful about. There are case reports, but no prospective trial. There is one that's opening. Um, there are many case reports actually of of some of these drugs used um, in the neoadjuvant setting. And so I just point out these, these two patients, one medullary here on the left and one papillary here on the right, um, who did have successful surgery. Of course, we all publish our successes, not necessarily our failures. So, um, and they're just case reports. But this one was stopped three days before surgery and didn't have any complications, the medullary patient. This one stopped linvatinib seven days before surgery and also had no postoperative complications. So um, I think 
it's it's possible to use these drugs in this setting. I think it needs to be used really for patients that really need it, um, rather than just you know it's difficult surgery to do, but you know you can do it without the neoadjuvant drug. Um, and I'm not a surgeon, so you know feel free to correct me on that. But I, I think that the risk is big enough that we have to be um, you know, rather careful about, about using the antiangiogenic drugs in that setting. Um, I'm not going to go through this slide, so um, so don't panic because it's a busy slide. This is a, about tumor board. It's kind of an algorithm of what we discuss in our tumor board, um, which we call multidisciplinary conference. But I just point out that neoadjuvant therapy, we always ask, you know, if the patient needs surgery, is neoadjuvant going to be helpful here? And is there a targeted mutation or fusion that might be safer drug than an antiangiogenic drug so that we can accomplish that. I feel like if you're, if we're gonna do um, a neoadjuvant uh, uh, lenvatinib um, or other antiangiogenic drug, it, sh it probably should be done in the context of clinical trial. So these are the clinical trials for uh, a neoadjuvant. We have the selpercatinib one that I, um, that I pointed out that we just opened here at MD Anderson. We're trying to open at other sites. There's, um, the one for the BRF mutated ATC patients with DTP. Um, and that one is very close to opening here and we're trying to open at other sites too. Um, I found this one interesting, this, I didn't know about it, but in Russia, they have a Dibraf and Tremetinib neoadjuvant trial that's open that, that for anaplastic, it's called Anaplast Neo. And um, there's the Linvatinib trial that I mentioned um, that uh, Greg Randolph has opened, um, or I think it's very close to opening. I don't think it's open just yet. Um, these two trials are from China, so I just want to point them out because I found them, you know, interesting. I didn't know about them, but they're these drugs that we're not too familiar with here in the United States, but it's an anti-PD-1 and a multi-kinase inhibitor in this study, and then an anti-PD-1 and a VEGF receptor inhibitor, a patinib, which is approved in China. Um, and these are both for differentiated thyroid cancer. So interesting strategies. I don't know how long they're going to hold these drugs prior to surgery. I couldn't even tell you for the lenvatinib. There may be somebody on this call that, that maybe knows and can put it in the chat. Okay, so in summary, uh, let's see how we're doing on time. Great. We're doing really good on time. Hopefully I didn't talk too fast. Um, just to summarize, uh, the neoadjuvant oncoprotein driver targeted therapy, so those are the selective inhibitors, um, they might be beneficial in patients uh, with thyroid cancer if they have that target, right? Because they have really fairly good response rates, at least BREF in ATC, um, retin intrec inhibitors. I didn't talk about too much about intrec inhibitors because we don't have an example yet of a neoadjuvant intrec inhibitor. Um, uh, used in practice, um, there. Um, I don't think we have a a, a case yet. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong about that. But um, these seem to be highly efficacious in papillary and poorly differentiated. So we could use those for neoadjuvant. Um, an MTC, if they have a ret mutation, you know, about 40% will have a, a ret mutation. A little higher if you include the um, the the MEN2 patients, um, those may be really, really good. And so we're, we're opening clinical trials with all of these except for the NTREC uh, inhibitor. Uh, and so we, we shall see. Uh, hopefully we can enroll those trials and, and you'll send us those patients to enroll. We're trying to open these studies in other sites so that patients don't all have to come to Houston to be enrolled on the sites. So we're trying to be really strategic geographically so that patients have um, sites that are closer to them. Um, VEGF receptor inhibitors, they do warrant further study in my opinion. Um, there are concerns about wound healing and bleeding with VEGF receptor inhibitors and fistulas. So, you know, you're operating close to the esophagus and the trachea, um, you could um, have issues with, with fistulas too. It's really not clear how long to, to hold the drug prior to surgery. In my opinion, um, and um, sorry, I, the, in my opinion, didn't fit on all the way into this slide, so I put IMO. Um, I would say four to five half-lives at minimum. So for lenvatinib, that means about six days um, before surgery. 
And um, I think that that's probably okay to do. I don't think the patients will progress that quickly off the VEGF receptor inhibitor if they have papillary, um, differentiated thyroid cancer. Now for anaplastic, you know, those patients, I, I wouldn't recommend doing, a, a, the, having VEGF receptor inhibitors um, as new adjuvant and ATC just yet. Um, because these patients, when you stop the drugs, they do actually rapidly progress. And so we need to do the DTC study first. Um, and then I would say discontinue the VEGF receptor inhibitor after surgery for sure. It you know, can be resumed later on once there's good wound healing. Um, so, um, but I, I, you know, immediately, I, I think post-op, at least for several weeks, they need to be off these VEGF receptor inhibitors. Um, and then, you know, patients really need to be aware of, of the potential complications and the patients um, um, need to know what they're getting into before they, before they undergo um, these, these treatments. So with that, I, um, I'll end it there and we have uh, plenty of time now for questions. Terrific. Uh, Maria, thank you. That was just an absolutely awesome lecture and we've got a lot of questions to uh, try to get through. Um, however, maybe you can just tell us a little bit about how FAST works and what the actual timeline is from a patient uh, calling in and saying, I've been diagnosed with, um, with an anaplastic thyroid cancer. What actually, what's the machinery that goes into effect um, once you get that call? Yeah, it's a, that's a great question. I, I, I didn't think I'd have enough time to go over it, but basically uh, once the patient or physician contacts us, to say either this patient has ATC or we think this patient has ATC, they're put into the FAST program. And um, so the business office doesn't need our permission to, to move ahead with, with, with scheduling the patient. Basically, um, we have these slots that are, um, that are kind of hidden for, um, for other diagnoses. So only the ATC patients can be put in those hidden slots for, for certain physicians. So there are three endocrinologists, uh, me, Naifa Basaiti, and Ramona Dadu that see these patients. And so we have our, these appointments spread out throughout the week so that we can always kind of work in these patients. And if we can't, we have kind of this backup as our attending on service. Um, and, and so they automatically get a, you know, an appointment with us the oncologic endocrinologist who becomes their primary, and then with head and neck surgery, um, head and neck radiation oncology, um, they get a speech consult, they get an appointment with head and neck medical oncology in case they need cytotoxic chemotherapy. Um, and the first thing we do is uh, oftentimes is rebiopsy because most patients don't come with the molecular information in hand. So, um, we're seeing more and more that they do, which is great. Um, but oftentimes we don't know what we need to first, the very first thing we need to do is to figure out if they have a BRAF mutation. Because if they do, you know, we can just order the drugs from our pharmacy. They can go down that very day and get on to BRAF and um, we, you know, we think that we've probably avoided tracheostomies in many patients who ended up having a BRAF mutation and were able to start very quickly on Dibraf and Tremetinib. So we biopsy, um, you know, we, we have all of these scans that are scheduled for them, um, basically head to toe scans. And um, if they've already had those, we can always cancel them, but they're already scheduled, they're pre-scheduled um, to be done after they see the, 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 um, the the oncologic endocrinologist. Um, we do a rapid stain with a BRAF uh, V600E antibody, and we're able to uh, identify the vast majority of our BRAF mutated patients within just a few days. So essentially it's the time to get the biopsy, and then within 24 hours of that biopsy, we have a result on our BRAF. Um, and so we can start these patients very, very quickly. Um, if they don't have a BRAF mutation, so we do all these other tests like liquid biopsy, you know, in case um, they don't have a BRAF mutation, we try and figure out what they have. It's a little bit faster than doing the molecular studies. And um, 
and and so we are you know if they don't have a BRAF mutation we're able to um, to figure out what their driver mutation is um, rather quickly uh, and then put them on a clinical trial so we have studies um, that I didn't discuss here, but um, we do have studies for anaplastic thyroid cancer that are mutation driven. Um, and and so we're we're trying to, um, and they're usually combined with immunotherapy. So we really don't like to use single agent um, targeted therapy. And I consider debrafenchment a single agent because it's targeting just one pathway, but we want to target multiple pathways. It's it's kind of like treating you know an acute leukemia. You're not going to do that with just one chemotherapy. You use several, and um, and so and it's because they they develop resistance so quickly. So we usually try to use a, you know a, a multi pathway um, uh, strategy and and get them on clinical trials. And we've been able to enroll our trials very successfully up until COVID. Um, so hopefully things will pick up again. I think they are picking up. Um, but, I, you know, we all need to work together to get these patients into these trials so we can enroll them and get these, you know, much needed uh, therapies out to patients. Because right now, if you don't have a BRAF mutation, it's really not clear what the best strategy is for those patients. So the goal really is to just streamline the process, not only streamline the process, though, is to streamline the process and enroll these trials so that we can get some um, some answers and some FDA approved drugs. And actually the debrafentromatinib, we were the highest enrolling site. Um, and we had already started fast. We had started fast just around that time and we were able to, to enroll many patients. Um, and you know, it, it wasn't just us, it was <clears throat> Japan and other, other sites, but um, but because of that, you know, we now have an FDA approved combination for BRAF mutated ATC. So it's really important that we all kind of work together to to get some good therapies out to these patients. And that's really the, the goal of FAST. Great. Thank you. Um, we have one question uh, that, that's really directed at um, establishing a diagnosis of ATC. And um, the question relates to whether or not you need a tissue diagnosis or whether or not you can rely upon cytology. Yeah, so <clears throat> um, cytology can be problematic because um, you oftentimes will get a diagnosis of poorly differentiated thyroid cancer, but they can't quite get to ATC. Um, and so we use the clinical behavior in conjunction with the um, with the cytology. Now, when patients come here, we try and get a core biopsy. Um, it, it gives us a little bit more information. Um, we also, in order to do BREF by IHC, we need to do that either on a cell block or, or core material. So we really try and get core when we can. Um, and we've convinced our radiologists of, for doing this basically for the BREF um, IHC. But it's also helpful to establish the diagnosis is, is to just get a little bit more, more tissue um, with a core. But oftentimes we do make the diagnosis based on, you know, massive tumor growing very quickly, the clinical scenario. Um, you know, patient has dysphagia and is hoarse and short of breath um, with a cytology that says poorly differentiated thyroid cancer. And sometimes they'll put in the comment, you know, clinical correlation. Um, you know, maybe kind of, you know, might be anaplastic thyroid cancer. So, um, so we do have to integrate the clinical information into this. Um, for our trials, it's been uh, challenging, right? Because you have to then put in a an entry criterion that that's going to include those patients who are, you know, they definitely clinically have ATC, um, but they come with just, you know. A, a smear, an FNA smear that says, you know, poorly differentiated thyroid cancer. And of course, they have no thyroglobulin, et cetera, right? And so we have to um, we, we have to do the entry criteria so that it it includes that clinical information. Um, it can be challenging sometimes, but um, but that's the only way to enro enroll these studies. Uh, and you know that might be crit criticized later, but um, when you go to publish these studies, 
but I think it's the right thing to do because oftentimes we can't get um, uh, you know a clear diagnosis of ATC on cytology. Okay. Um, Dr. Pintoya has raised the question of whether or not you have experience in using NTREC inhibitors as neoadjuvant uh, pre-surgical therapy. I wish that we did. Um, we we don't right now. And um, essentially, the problem with NTREC it's a complicated issue. So the immunostain is really not great. Um, it requires a lot of tissue because we have we see NTREC one and three fusions, so it's very difficult to establish that diagnosis, that molecular diagnosis in a short amount of time. The IHC is not great, which is what's helped us with the BRAF patients to get them to neoadjuvant. Um, the um, you know the liquid biopsies are terrible for NTREC fusions. They don't they don't even check NTREC three at all. Um, and then some of the commercial platforms, um, they they look at the fusion partner, so ETV6, but don't actually um, test for NTREC3. And so you're going to miss those NTREC3 fusions that are novel fusions that are not ETV6. Um, and so it's been difficult to establish, to find these patients, just, just to find them, right? So um, they're very rare. Uh, these are usually going to be your papillary derived, and um, um, it, they're just hard to find. And by the time you figure out that they have an NTREC fusion, um, they're usually already, you know, on some other therapy like radiation. Uh, so, so we haven't been able to find any, but I think that we will eventually. Um, I think, you know, thanks to um, Thyroseq. We can, we've seen like these papillary patients that come already with a diagnosis of NTREC fusion because Thyroseq is very good. It, it, it picks up NTREC 1 and 3 um, with the novel fusion partners. And so, um, so sometimes we'll see that in papillary and it's just a matter of time before we see that in an anaplastic patient. Great. Um, can you speak to just uh, one of the assumptions of neoadjuvant therapy is somewhat of a concentric um, shrinkage of the tumor. Um, obviously, you're not going back and re-resecting the original envelope of, um, of, of how the disease presents here. And um, in following these patients, has that always held up um, as being the case that you don't have areas where the disease originally was located and you've got perhaps microscopic disease that then emerges? after surgery? Yeah, that, and that's exactly why we want, you know, we want to do radiation on, especially the 4B patients. Um, we used to do radiation on the 4C patients, but we just lose control. But yeah, it's, I think it's important to consolidate that with radiation in, in these anaplastic patients. And also it's really important to look at the preoperative, the, the pre-neoadjuvant um, uh, kinase inhibitor, uh, a CT scan to see where did they have disease originally because you need to do the nodal dissection in those areas. If you don't do it when you stop the inhibitor, it's just going to grow back in that area. And so um, it's 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 really critical that the surgeon look at that original CT scan to see where was the disease because they need to dissect out those areas. I'm not a surgeon. Other than that, that's all I can tell you. <laughs> okay. All righty. Um, how how often do you rescan patients um, during uh, um, treatment? Uh, so I typically do my first scan um, at two months, really because that's kind of the earliest that the insurance is going to let me scan them again. So um, at two months, um, if they're ATC patients, then after that two month scan we start to uh, plan surgery because we've seen patients um, progress as early as three months on therapy. And so, um, so then the, you know, the surgeon is shown the, the two month scan um, and they typically will, uh, if they, if they look like they're resectable, they'll put them in for surgery, you know, like in another month or two. Um, and then right before that surgery, the surgeon gets another scan. So um, to be sure that 
that the patient hasn't progressed prior. So it's usually like a every two month really schedule. Um, two months for the first one, two months for the surgery, and there's a preoperative, like the day before the surgery, the patient has a CT scan of the neck with contrast. Okay. And what what trigger what's the trigger for looking for the emergence of new mutations? Is it um, is it new disease? Um, or do you uh, and are you checking um, existing disease that um, has stabilized? How do you, how do you go about that process? Yeah, so when we have a patient who's progressed, um, if we can't get a biopsy of the progressing lesion, it has to be of the one that's progressing, then we do liquid biopsy, and oftentimes we'll catch it on liquid biopsy. You'll see BRAF with RAS or BRAF with some other mutation. Um, it's just the most common one is RAS. Uh, whenever we can, we try and biopsy, though, the, the progressing lesion. It's just that sometimes it's not in a place that you can biopsy um, or, or, you know, for whatever reason, we're not able to do it. So we always get the liquid biopsy, too, um, just in case, you know, for whatever reason, the pa even if the patient can get a biopsy, you know, something happens and they have to, they didn't get tissue or, or you know, we always have that fail safe as our liquid biopsy, which is pretty good at, at picking up these these new um, mutations. Great. Um, can you speak for just a moment about how often um, following neoadjuvant therapy that you're able to achieve an R0 versus an R1 resection? And is there, have you noticed any different in outcome, difference in outcomes? Haven't, I don't think that we have enough patients to notice a difference in outcomes. I couldn't tell you how many are R0 and R1. I'd have to go back and look at that. That's that's in the series of the, the first series in thyroid with the six patients, and I can send that paper along. But, um, you know, the majority are probably going to be R1s, I would say. And, um, but we we try whenever we can to consolidate that with radiation. Um, I couldn't tell you if there are any differences. I don't think there are enough patients to, to be able to say. Maybe right. the clinical trial could answer that. Right. Um, and how? what do you consider to be an acceptable period of time to be off, um, off BRAF inhibition or off DTB um, uh, when a patient is taken to surgery, how quickly do you reinstitute therapy? Yeah, so um, I actually I want to talk about how, uh, when we stop before surgery and when we resume. So uh, take you through the whole thing. So um, we so we usually use dabrafenib. The dabrafenib is actually not a problem for surgery, um, and we continue the BRAF inhibitor right up to the day of surgery. So they don't take it the morning of surgery, but they take it the evening because um, it's a BID drug. The trametinib is um, it's a MEK inhibitor and it has some VEGF inhibition. It's I don't know how much. I've never been able to answer that question. No PharmD has ever been able to answer that question for me. But it has some mild antiangiogenic properties and you'll see patients can develop a little bit of hypertension, um, which you know makes sense. Um, so we stopped the trametinib because it also has a, a long half-life, um, and, and I should, probably should have put up the half-life uh, on that slide, but we usually stop it for about five days before surgery. Um, and, uh, and so the patients are off five days from the trametinib, no days for the BRAF inhibitor, they go to surgery, and then usually they're seen the next week in, um, in the surgeon's clinic. And at that point, um, you know, the surgeon will will email me or, or, or call me in to, to see the patient um, and say whether the surgical wound looks like it's good enough to, to restart therapy. So usually it's a, around a week. Um, it kind of depends on when that patient is showing up for the post-op visit, right? Because if they have a prolonged hospital stay, which many actually don't, surprisingly, um, then, then that might be pushed out a little bit later, but we wait until they come for their post-op visit, you know, look at that wound, make sure that they're doing okay, and then um, if the surgeon says it's okay, then we restart. Cool. Now, that's, you know, and, and th there's also a timing issue with radiation, because we typically start radiation about two weeks after the surgery, two, no more than four weeks after the surgery, 
during the time that they're waiting to, to start radiation, we have them on that BRAF MEK inhibitor combination again, and then they stop it again before their radiation starts. Great. And, and the Pembro, I'm sorry, how, how soon before surgery do you stop that? Yeah, so we actually are not too concerned about Pembro with surgery. And so, you know, we 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 give it, if, a, if the schedule, it just ends up, because it's every three-week infusion, if it ends up being that they are scheduled for Pembrolizumab, you know, two days before the surgery, we, we give it. Um, uh, you know, we haven't really had any problems with that. We also in the post-operative, um, we give it, and during radiation, we give it. Um, I like to give the pembrolizumab, the, the checkpoint inhibitor, during the radiation because we feel like it it, it may actually, um, um, you know, radiosensitize the patient a little bit more, um, and particularly for their distant metastatic disease. So we did a study. Um, um, a while back ago now with uh, stereotactic radiation with immunotherapy. I know there have been many studies out there with this, but we actually had a thyroid cancer cohort. Um, and so, you know, we would give, um, in, in this particular trial, it was ipilimumab, so the CTLA-4. Um, we would give the, the radiation first, the stereotactic radiation to a lesion usually in the lung or liver. And then we would give ipilimumab for, uh, I can't remember how many cycles, I think it was three cycles. Uh, and then we would look at the response in the other lesions, right, that weren't radiated. And we did see some nice responses. So, um, you know, these patients, especially if they have distant disease, like I know I said 4C, don't, uh, no RT, no XRT, but um, we, it, that's not a hard and fast rule. So we sometimes have patients with very low volume distant metastatic disease um, who we, we give them external beam radiation and then we just look watch their distant disease halfway through radiation. But I love to give those patients pembrolizumab during radiation um, in hopes that we'll maintain that response in the, in the distant metastatic disease that's not being radiated. That's awesome. Listen, I apologize that we've uh, we have gone over the nine o'clock hour. Um, I think we could have uh, um, kept this discussion going um, uh, for for quite a bit longer. I want to congratulate you on this uh, really incredible pioneering work on an outstanding lecture. Thank you for um, setting the standards for um, the treatment of these really difficult cases for the rest of us around the world. And um, and, and I also want to just one more time put in a quick plug for our next week's program. It's our inaugural um, thyroid tumor board. Mike Tuttle will be um, uh, both uh, enlightening and entertaining us um, uh, for that. And we'll be running uh, that program every two months. Uh, we encourage all of our listeners to send in their challenging cases for discussion. Um, we'll tell you a little bit more about that next week. Everybody uh, stay safe and thank you for joining us. Maria, thanks again. Thank you. Happy weekend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.